All right. Well, welcome everybody to my session uh, about entitled Growing in the Cloud. Uh, this talk is about my journey to create, believe it or not, hot sauce using IoT messaging Micronaut, which is an open source Java framework, and uh, some other cloud technologies. And I used all those to automate and monitor seedling growth to help me grow chili peppers to create hot sauce. So a little bit about me. I am a developer advocate, and that means I get to talk to developers, learn from developers, uh, a little bit of evangelism, talk about some of our technologies and products to them, but mostly listen to them, gather their feedback, gather their experience, and take it back to our engineers and our project managers to help make better products. You can find me on Twitter, YouTube, all those fun places in the social world. My blog is recursive.codes, as well as my GitHub. So I'd like to make a promise to you and uh, for the physical and virtual attendees. In this session, I will show you how I used microcontrollers, sensors, and the cloud to create what I call the world's greatest hot sauce. Of course, that's based on my opinion, but uh, also the feedback of some, some friends that I've shared it with. So it's not just mine, but mostly it's my opinion. So the motivation for this project, um, personally, myself, I had... Uh, a little bit of a rough year in 2020. Um, not just me then? Okay, yeah. So we were all kind of stuck at home, right? Uh, and a lot of people were used that time and that challenge to take on new projects or new kind of hobbies. Uh, a lot of people, for example, were making sourdough bread and, and all kinds of fun things. But for myself, one of my passions is cooking and spicy food. And I just absolutely love cooking. It's always been one of the things that kind of keeps me uh, motivated and just something I love to do. So uh, I was at a farmer's market in my town, of course. Oh, you know what? If you don't mind, I'm going to makes it easier to not keep breathing my own air while I talk here. So, uh, But of course, I was masked up properly and socially distanced and all that at the farmer's market, <laughs> except for the one lovely old lady who insisted on licking her finger to separate the bags, which I politely asked her not to. Um, but for the most part, things were safe and uh, saw these beautiful peppers that you see here. And I thought, you know what? I love hot sauce. I love spicy food. I'm going to try to make some hot sauce. So, so I bought a bunch of these peppers and brought them home and chopped them up, uh, mixed them with little onions, a little garlic, carrot, things like that and threw them in a jar with a brine, sal saline solution of brine, and left them to ferment for a few weeks. Come back a few weeks later, blend it up, mix it with a little vinegar, and bottled it, and there's my hot sauce. So that was 2020, right? Well, 2021 came around in the late winter, January, February time frame, and I said, you know, I want to make hot sauce again this year, but I want to up it. I want to up the challenge for myself. I want to actually grow the peppers myself from seed. Now, I've dabbled with gardening a little bit, and I'm certainly not a master horticulturist or any gardener or anything like that. But I thought, I want to give this a shot. And I thought, well, what else can I do? How can I, how can I up this even more? And I said, well, um, Maybe I can mix it with another one of my passions. And obviously, another one of my passions is technology and the cloud and microcontrollers and things like this. So I said, OK, well, what if I actually create a system to help me monitor and automate the growth of these peppers? You know, just a little simple system that would help me do this. And so the result of that is what I'm calling Project Green Thumb. And that's what we're here to talk about today. So. I did my research, and I identified these five separate metrics that I could try to control throughout the growing process. And this is, again, based on some research, doing some reading, determining what's the best environment, what's the best uh, temperatures and light and humidity and moisture, what is the best environment to grow these pepper seedlings in. So I came up with the, the objectives that you see here. Daytime temperature, 65 to 80 degrees which is 18 to 26 for those people who use that weird scale. Uh, soil temperature, moisture, humidity, and light. The light being measured in lux. So that's my objective. 
Let's talk a little bit about the architecture, just to give you an overview of what I decided to do. So I said, as I said, I, I was going to use a microcontroller and some sensors to monitor and automate the process. And what I figured I would do is collect the data on the microcontroller, broadcast that to a messaging queue in the cloud, in this case using RabbitMQ, and then consume that messaging queue with an application that could be used to visualize real-time data as it happens, as well as generate some reports and things like that. Now, I know it's all the rage to use the microservices these days, but I didn't use a microservice. As we uh, probably know, there's really nothing wrong with using a monolith here and there, especially when there's something like this where it's not really suited. Um, and then the microservice or the application would also persist that data to the database. So before I go on, I want to talk about, since we're at the Open Source Summit, I want to talk a little bit about why open source matters to me. Just a little deviation here, and I thought I'd throw it in here. So for me, open source is kind of like cooking, right? If you think about it, if you went to a five-star Michelin restaurant, and you sat down and you had the best meal of your life, and you went up to the chef afterwards and you said, hey, that whatever, that pasta dish was amazing. Could you share the recipe with me? At that restaurant, he might say, nah, it's kind of a, a secret, you know. But for the most part, in my experience with cooking, cooking is kind of open source. A lot of people like to share recipes. They come up with this plan, and you can build upon that plan. You can modify that plan. You can make it your own, right? And so open source is very similar to that, right? We can take these projects that exist. We can build upon them. We can modify them. We know what's in them, and we can cook our software. So lower hardware costs. For me, a project like this would not at all be possible if I was worried about infrastructure, if I was in need of really robust servers on the, in the cloud, uh, if I had to pay licensing costs for hardware on things like that. It would just be cost prohibitive as a hobby project. Just wouldn't be able to happen. Now with open source, with Linux, servers, I can deploy this on an always free tier of a cloud provider, in my case Oracle, um, but it really helps me to work on these kind of projects that I otherwise probably wouldn't be able to deploy. Obviously this means lower development costs and time, I think that's kind of a no-brainer. Flexibility and transparency. So um, I think about a story that happened about 10 years ago uh, the team I was on at a, at a firm building government software were pretty used to using a off-the-shelf product, and Stephen knows what product I'm talking about, Cold Fusion. Um, we used that quite a lot. And it was a rapid deployment, rapid development platform. It was very easy to use, low barrier to entry, but it was proprietary. It wasn't open source. And... Um, we had made a decision at one point to switch over to a more open uh, platform, more open framework, more open, open source technologies. And really early on in our, in our development cycle, I identified a pretty critical bug with um, encoding user input, which as we know is a pretty, pretty big deal. You know, you don't want to use uh, display user input on a page without it being properly encoded and escaped we can have serious security vulnerabilities. Well, I identified that issue, I went to the source, I created a patch, I submitted it, and within two days, that was merged and published into the next release of the framework. If we had that same issue with that off-the-shelf product, now, of course, they do worry about security vulnerabilities, but being a commercial product, they had you know, Solaris, Windows, they had all these platforms they needed to support, so, um, and, and not only that, but prioritize the bug. Is it even a priority? Is it, does it affect enough people? And it just makes it much more difficult to, number one, understand that there may be vulnerabilities inside the product because we can't look at the code, but to be able to patch and fix those and push those out into production. Uh, finally, open source really kind of grew my career. You know, uh, being involved in some early open source projects, and contributing to them really helped me network with some of the, the members of the Java community and other communities that I'm a part of. And 
just putting my own open source out to the world is a really good way to, it's kind of like a living resume for your own code, right? If you can just point somebody to your GitHub repository and say, here's what I've done, you know, it's a really good way to show people what you've done. So that's why open source matters to me. So I want to do a quick demo here. If you'd like to follow along, you can hit that link, but I will have it up on the screen so you can see uh, what's going on here. So I'm going to show you the actual system itself. And it's this little mess of wires that you see here. And let me pull that up next to it. So this is the actual deployed application running in the cloud on the right-hand side of the screen. And on the left-hand side of the screen, you see this little box with a little breadboard inside. There is a microcontroller down at the bottom soldered to the breadboard. Now you see all these wire connectors here. That happened because I was giving this talk virtually a couple months ago. And in the morning, I went to test it out, and nothing worked. So I had to cut everything out and basically rewire the whole system. So I did it the quick way and uh, just pieced them back together with these connectors. So this is a little mini OLED display, very, very tiny. And basically, it gave me a way to have a instant feedback, instant result just by looking at it. There was a, a lid to this case. I didn't print, well, you know, obviously with these connectors, it's hard to fit that lid back on. So uh, that's why it's kind of loose and open right now. But there was a nice lid on it that uh, when it was sealed, the only thing you could see is that little OLED display. So these wires coming out of the side here, if I can grab them without knocking everything over up here. So he, these are all the different sensors attached. So this sensor right here, for example, is a light sensor. And this actually reads light and displays the amount of lux in the light. Uh, this sensor here is a probe thermometer, which was nice because I, once I had my seedling tray, I just plug this right in the middle of the soil, and it allowed me to monitor the soil temperature. This temperature sensor here is called a DHT11, and this allowed me to monitor the actual air temperature and humidity in the uh, seedling tray. And finally, this corroded sensor here is a water sensor. Now, <clears throat> one would think that if a manufacturer was making a sensor that was intended to measure moisture, that it would not corrode. But apparently, I learned my lesson. And these sensors are more intended to measure like air moisture kind of thing, like in a, near a, maybe near a, a furnace or a, a freezer or something like that. Now, they do make capacitive uh, moisture sensors that have like a, a rubber coating on them. And uh, lesson learned, I'll be using that next year when I come back to it, but it did the job. Uh, finally, this connection here, if I can move this over slightly. Actually, let me move the camera. So this is a regular standard electrical junction box. But the special thing about it is inside of it, there is a relay that allows me to turn the outlet on and off. So the purpose of this is to help me regulate the temperature within the soil. And I did that with one of these, which is just a heat mat, kind of like a heating pad that you would put on a sore muscle, but without the fancy fabric cover. It's just like a rubber mat that plugs into the outlet and heats up your soil medium. Now, of course, I learned later on that they sell these with inline temperature controls, but that's OK. Uh, nothing wrong with doing it yourself and, and managing it yourself. And of course, it did keep the costs down. This was only about $12 on Amazon. So uh, really nice way to, monitor, to regulate the temperature within my soil medium. Now, uh, plugged in and with, combined with my probe thermometer that monitors the temperature, I just turn it on when the temperature goes above or goes below a certain threshold and turn it back on when it goes, uh, well, you get the idea, on and off depending on the temperature, right? Um, so essentially, I was able to automate the temperature of the soil that I was growing this in. Now, you may ask yourself, ask yourself why I didn't take it further and automate the actual moisture level of the soil. 
And there's a good reason for that. It's not because I'm lazy or didn't want to. Um, I did think about it. I considered it maybe um, hooking up a pump or something like that where I could pump water into it below a certain moisture threshold. But that was one of the <clears throat> metrics that I was a little less comfortable with automating because I don't have the experience. I didn't know what the appropriate level would be. So I figured, well, I'll collect all this data. I'll see how it did. And then next year, I'll be able to enhance it with that knowledge that I've gained. So yeah, there's, of course, opportunities to, to go even further, to automate more. But sometimes less is more. And um, that's the route I chose to go with. So let me plug this in and show you actually how it works, or show you it working. So I'll plug this in. And it's powered by USB. So if we come back over here, the OLED's still going to be pretty hard to read. But what it's trying to do now is connect to the hotspot running on my phone, which let me make sure is turned on. And it's not, because Android is kind enough to shut that off if nothing connects to it. So I'll try that again. Now that my hotspot is running and we don't have to rely on conference Wi-Fi here, it should connect up any second now. And now it's connected. And so I'll plug in this little LED, and you can see that the outlet, if I, well, you could probably see it in person here, but also through the camera, you can see that the outlet itself is on. Now, if we look at the web page on the right here, we can see that in real time, I'm getting data every second that's published to these real time charts. So my air temperature is steady at 73 degrees. It just jumped a little bit. Really nice way to get that direct immediate feedback of the current air temperature. And all of the latest current values are shown at the top of the page kind of at a glance so you can see what's going on there. Soil temperature here, 72.5 degrees. If we demonstrate the soil temperature going up, you could see that the outlet was turned off. The LED is now off. So just showing you how the soil temperature actually works. And it gives me that nice line in the chart to show me that the outlet went off. As it cools down a little bit, the outlet will turn back on once it falls back below that threshold. Moisture level, 0%, obviously. Uh, if I do take a little bit of water here, we should be able to demonstrate that. There we go. So you can see that I've got a little water and I'm dipping the moisture sensor into that. So you can see that it properly measures moisture in real time. And I do have this running an update every second for demo purposes here at the conference. But in reality, I got it updating much less frequently at home because I don't need this real time data for growing seedlings. Um, humidity. 58% staying pretty steady. And again, the light level sensor is reporting pretty low light in this room. But if I do expose it to some light, we should see that jump quite a bit as well. So the, yeah, we jumped way up over 500 there. So that's how the system works, essentially. It, it allows me to control the soil temperature uh, that we're growing in. It allows me to monitor the, the, the moisture, the humidity, temp air temperature, all those kind of things. Let's jump back to the slides here. Now, as someone famous kind of once said, talk is cheap, show me the code. So from now on, we're going to kind of basically be looking at the code behind the scenes and seeing how that works. And I want to start out with the actual Arduino code. So do we, have we all experienced with Arduino? We're somewhat familiar with it. So essentially, one of the awesome things about Arduino that I don't talk about at normal conferences, although I, maybe I should, is that the Arduino platform is open source. It is the entire hardware and the software ecosystem, the IDE that you use to program it, it's all open source. And that's really nice to me because it makes it accessible. It makes it, to me, it, it drives the cost down because people are able to take those prototype schematics for the boards and reproduce them at much lower costs. 
So it really kind of keeps it as a very accessible technology for doing projects like this. Um, that's not to say there's anything wrong with Raspberry Pi and having a, a proprietary chip. You know, it has its uses, it has its uh, upside and downside, but uh, it's one of the reasons I, I really like working with Arduino. Now, I shouldn't say, uh, I should also say that Raspberry Pi has come out with the RP2040, which is open source, and uh, so I can't fully knock them. Uh, not that I'm knocking them, but it's one of the benefits and the draws of Arduino for me. So essentially, Arduino, one of the reasons it's very nice for projects like this is there's no overhead of an operating system or anything like that. You essentially have one binary program that runs, you, you flash it to the, to the board, and it, you plug it in, power it on, and it runs. There's, at its very basic minimum, there are two functions required in your code. A setup function, as that implies, it runs the first time the board is powered on and allows you to do things like connect to Wi-Fi or establish, you know, system, uh, establish variables for your, for your local uh, environment. And then there's a loop function, and that loop function just runs continuously over and over until the board is powered off. It's entirely single-threaded, although we can do things like interrupts and timers to kind of mimic multi-threaded uh, type code. But essentially, it's just a single-threaded loop that runs constantly. If we don't want it to run, we can put in things like delays to delay the frequency in which the function runs. So the two things I want to show you here, uh, well, more than two, but the main thing here is the fact that I'm using the Adafruit MQTT library, and that allows me to easily publish to my MQTT server that's running in the cloud. Um, are we all familiar with MQTT? I'm fascinated by MQTT. So it's, a, it's essentially an open source uh, messaging protocol, and there are several implementations that allows you to do very lightweight messaging. Um, it was originally developed for the oil and gas industry, believe it or not. Uh, remote pipelines way out in the field. They wanted a way to publish data from those that could be reliable, very lightweight, because obviously you're re resource constrained in, in remote oil and gas fields. And so they developed this, uh, I believe it was IBM, that developed the, the protocol for MQTT. It's just basically publishing and subscribing. It's not a durable queue, so you're just publishing messages off into the ether. If there's nothing consuming it, they just disappear into the ether. It's not like something like Kafka, where you have a durable queue that um, is resilient, that maintains your messages that are queued when the consumer goes offline. So it's just publishing messages up into the cloud and really lightweight, like I said, and allows you to do things like this with IoT devices. So down here on lines 50 and 51 is where I establish my connection. And I'm not going to show you my credentials here because that would be silly of me, but essentially I just create an instance of the MQTT library I have spilled my water on your board over here, sir. <laughs> Sorry. Do you have a towel? That could be bad. All right. Well, good times. So, uh, sorry about that. I will move that away from there. <laughs> What's your name again? Colton. Colton? Yes. You're the man. <laughs> Appreciate your help. Um, all right. So I create an instance of MQTT, pass it my server, my port, my user, and my password, uh, which also receives an instance of a Wi-Fi client so it knows how to, wh what uh, internet connection to use for that publishing. And then I establish a readings topic, and that is simply where I pass it an instant, that instance of MQTT that I created here, and then the name of the topic. Topics in MQTT are oftentimes uh, separated by a slash like that, and it's just a pipe, a channel, that I'm using to publish all my messages to. So skipping past some of this other code, we come down to my setup method, and essentially what I do here is I initialize the pins on the board, and in this case, I tell it what pins to use for what purpose. So for example, pin S0, I want to use as an output pin, meaning 
in this case, I think that goes along with my monitor, so it's an output. It's something that I'm producing from the board. Input pins are pins that are used for inputs, things like sensors uh, and other devices that you can connect that input data into the system. I set up my display, I initialize my Wi-Fi connection, and then we come down here to the loop function. And this is where the cool things happen. So with Arduino, essentially you need to either read or write. So you're reading from inputs or writing to outputs. And at the very basic level, something like this water sensor is an analog sensor, and I can use something called an analog read function, and I tell it which pin to read from, and I can read a value. So it's very basic, very simple. That's how I can read and interact with a sensor. Some things like this DHT11 are a little more complicated, a little more complex, not terribly, but oftentimes you will find, as you can see on line 146, that there are open source libraries out there that'll, that'll help you read from these types of sensors. So if you see on 146, I'm using the DHT library and I use the, call the read11 function. I tell it what pin that sensor is connected to. And then on the next line, you can see that I have uh, an object returned from that function or, or from the library that allows me to check the current temperature and the current humidity. I also have a helper function to convert that from Celsius to Fahrenheit because the initial sensor reading it comes in in Celsius. And we can go further and look at other t examples here. The probe thermometer, for example, has its own library. Uh, as I said, the moisture sensor that I just showed you has just uses the basic Arduino analog read function and so on and so forth. So I collect all this data up. I create strings and that's used to display on my little OLED display here. But at the end of that, what I'm also doing is creating a JSON document and I'm setting different, all those values into that JSON document. So the current relay state, whether it's on or off, the air temperature, the soil temperature, all these things I'm setting into this JSON object, I'm serializing it, and then finally down here on 225, I'm publishing that up to that MQTT topic. So I've got this JSON object, every 10 seconds, 60 seconds, however often, in this case, one second, uh, I'm publishing that up to the MQTT topic. So it's just this nice JSON string. It's going out over the air and everything's good. Now let's talk about, um, before I go to the, the actual processing and consuming of that topic, I wanna talk a little bit about the database schema. So there are options, of course, how I could persist this data into the database. And I wanted to persist it because I wanted to be able to run reports and queries on it and aggregations and things like that. So it was important to persist the data into a database for me. Um, I could have created, there's, there's a couple options. I could have created separate tables for every sensor. For example, the, the outlet sensor is a Boolean value. It's on or off, it's true or false, essentially. Um, the probe thermometer, it has a float type reading, it gives me back a decimal type data. The light gives me an integer. So I could have created a separate table, you see what I'm saying, for each of these and had a custom column for all those different types. That's not very flexible, it's very rigid. Um, I thought maybe a better option might be to just store this data as JSON in the database. And that gave me a little more flexibility because if I had more sensors or if I change one of these sensors, maybe I decided I don't need a float anymore, let's just round, you know, it keeps it flexible, allows me to have a little bit of flexibility. So I created this table, and let me actually show you that real quick. It's just the schema of it. Did we time out? Oh, there we go. So, yeah, it was, wasn't it? Maybe I spilled the water on my machine. All right, so I have an ID column, it's a number, it's an auto number, just gives me a primary key for each reading. Then I'm storing the reading, I have a column for the reading as a CLOB, character large object, and that's what I'm using to store the JSON string in the database. 
And then I just have a basic created on timestamp so I know, so I can order and sort and things like that. The, uh, there is a constraint on the reading column to ensure that the reading is valid JSON. So this allows me to make sure that I'm not persisting like a broken JSON string and maybe it didn't get read fully. I want to make sure that it's actual JSON so I have that constraint on it. So if we query that table really quickly, we can see that very simply, like I said, the JSON is stored in that reading column. The nice thing about the Oracle database is that it treats that JSON as basically a first class citizen in the database. So I can actually query directly into that into that column and actually pull those values out individually. This allows me to do those nice aggregations. So if I wanted to pull out those and I wanted to pull out the air temp, is it air temp or air temperature? Air temp, okay. And I can do whatever I need to, right? I can order by, so uh, it treats it all like a first class citizen in my uh, table so that I can sort it aggregate, do all those fun things. So I also have some materialized views. We won't look at those right now, but essentially this allowed me the flexibility to store that JSON into the database and work with it further. Let's talk now about the actual Micronaut application that does the persistence, does the visualization, all that fun stuff. So is anybody familiar with Micronaut or Java? Are we, yeah, yeah, okay, awesome. So Micronaut is my favorite framework to use in the Java world. We've kind of taken this shift in the last few years, as you're probably familiar with, from doing things at runtime to doing things at compile time. So we're seeing frameworks like Quarkus and Micronaut that are coming up with these uh, very intelligent, very smart, ways of pre-compiling our code, uh, inferring things based on annotations, and making our runtime performance much better. So in the past, you know, a lot of things, a lot of the frameworks and libraries that we relied upon did a lot of that stuff at runtime. And it stored all that stuff using reflection and, and proxies and things like that, stored all that stuff in memory, which is, you know, the old joke, memory is cheap, right? But you know, we're moving into this cloud age where memory is cheap, but if we lower that memory consumption, our costs can go down. And if we want to use things like serverless technologies, we need to be more performant. At runtime, we can't have cold starts that take five seconds, 10 seconds. That's just a deal breaker in the Java world. And it's why some other languages have kind of gained so much traction in that serverless world because they have that very low you know, startup time, cold startups are immediate with Node or, or Go or some of these other languages. So Java had to kind of catch up in that world and that's why I think you're seeing a lot of these types of frameworks that use this compile time style of uh, basically to, to make up for them. So I wanna show you real quickly, uh, if you're not familiar, with Micronaut, I want to show you how quickly I can get up and running. Because to me, someone who's been around the JVM for almost 20 years, but really not worked directly in Java, in other words, I've been in JVM style languages, uh, one of the biggest things to me, biggest barriers to entry in the Java world was setup and configuration and getting, how do you get a web server up and running? How do you get Netty up and running or Jetty or, or any of these types of things? So the reason I really, one of the reasons I really like Micronaut is it lowers that barrier to entry. It makes it really easy to get an app up and running. So as an example, I have the Micronaut CLI installed. And if I call create app and I tell it the build system I want to use, in this case, Gradle, you can also choose Maven, uh, the JDK I want to use, the language I want to use because it supports Kotlin and Groovy as well. So in this case, I want to use Java. And then tell it the name of my application and in this case, I'm gonna also do a copy for the, um, the Gradle wrapper because otherwise we'd be waiting a while for that to download here. So if I create that, I've got an application created. So if I move into that, 
and we take a look, we see all those files, they're there for me. I didn't have to create them. I didn't have to create a build script in Gradle. I didn't have to create the structure of my, my, my application. I didn't have to create any of the manifests or any of the other files that are necessary to get this up and running. It's just all done for me. And if I wanted to create, for example, a controller, we just call MN create controller, and I've got a controller. So let's take a look really quickly at that controller. And this is the code I get out of the box when I scaffold out a controller. So it's a, it's a public class annotated with at controller. Just tell it the path that you want it to be available on. And then identify your routes within that as different methods. So in this case, we have a single method just available at hello slash that returns a string example response. So to run that at this point, using the Gradle wrapper, I hit Gradle W run, and within about one second, as you can see there, I've got my server up and running and ready to respond to requests. So as you can see there, you have your example response. So within two minutes, I've got an entire project scaffolded it out, ready to go. I don't have to create the main method. I don't have to, it's just ready to go. It just lowers that barrier to entry for me. I can focus on the actual code that makes my application what it is. So to me, that's something that's pretty impressive. And um, one of the other really awesome things about Micronaut is it has a very extensive open source plugin ecosystem around it. So they call them features in Micronaut, but if you've used something like Spring or Grails or, or something like this, you're probably familiar with plugins. And these are either community contributed or developed by the uh, core team. And they're essentially just little bits that we can add into our application to make other things easier. One of the really cool plugins features available in Micronaut is something called Micronaut Data. And this makes persistence of basically basic CRUD operations, it makes them very easy to use. And I want to show you how this application uses Micronaut data. So let me jump into presentation mode here. And so the first thing we have to do when we use Micronaut data, well, we have to make sure that we have the dependencies that we need and we can get those by passing them into the MN create app command on the command line as just named features as, at the command line, or we can go to launch.micronaut.io, which is a nice web-based GUI that lets you drop down menu, pick which features you want to add, your JDK, all that stuff. So a couple different ways we can get that, then we can download that and run it. So the first thing we need to do if we want to add persistence with Micronaut data is create an entity. And an entity in this case is just a basic POJO, right? It's just a class with some properties. In this case, all of the properties map to my database columns. Uh, then the other nice thing about Micronaut data, like many similar types of libraries, it actually maps things like ugly underscore cased database columns to nice to look at camel case columns in, in, the, in our Java code. I'm not sure why we ever determined that underscore was the best way to store our database column names, but it is what it is, and uh, typically we, we go along with that. But it's smart enough to, to interpret those types of things, right? We just tell it the table name, and if I were to actually, if I were to just name this green, green thumb readings like this, it would be smart enough to interpret that itself. But just to illustrate that there is a way to uh, map a class name to a different table name, I show you that we can do uh, add this entity name, uh, table name attribute to the class to, to specify that. And I've also annotated it with at entity. And these are, are built-in classes. Actually, in this case, these are JPA uh, annotations that it, it identifies and, and knows what they mean. So We've got a constructor, we've got getters and setters, just your typical type of POJO class that uh, we've seen probably a thousand times before if we've worked with Java. Now the next thing we need to do is create what's called a reading repository, or a, a repository. And 
This interface, as you see here, size okay on that? Yeah, okay. So this interface, as you see here, extends the pageable repository interface. And the pageable repository interface uh, class is a built-in class in Micronaut. So we just extend that. We tell it our entity type and the type that is used for the ID for that table. And if I were to have nothing else, if this line wasn't even here, line 12, and I compiled this and I ran it, at runtime I would have create, read, update, delete, get, all of those methods implemented for me, all done. Don't have to write a single line of code beyond this. They're all already in inferred by that compile time introspection that looks at the metadata, it looks at the table, all that kind of fun stuff is done for me. I don't have to write another single line of code. Now, in this case, I wanted to have an async method to be able to save these items uh, asynchronously. So the only thing I need to do is provide a signature that uses, that ends in the word async and returns an async compatible value, in this case, a completable future. And then what it's trying to save, which is the reading class, and again, this is implemented for me, uh, all done at compile time and ready to go. In this case, since I've implemented pageable repository, I've also get support for pagination. So uh, on my list methods, I can pass it a page item which contains the start and the end, and it gives me built-in pagination out of the box. There are other types of repositories that you can implement. Um, Check the documentation on that. And the only other thing I need to do is annotate that with at repository. Now this is the JPA compatible Micronaut data, which is Hibernate, if you think of JPA. Um, there's also a JDBC uh, Micronaut data flavor, if you will, that will not use any kind of Hibernate type thing. It'll just write out raw SQL for you that will be executed at runtime against uh, the database. So depending on your needs and what you want to do, there, there are options to go that way. Now, that's nice, that's helpful. CRUD is boring and boilerplate, so we don't, I don't personally like to write boring inserts and updates and gets and lists. Um, but it's a little rigid, not rigid, um, limiting, so it's just basic CRUD. What if we wanted to do more than basic CRUD? What if I wanted to run my reporting queries against the database? Well, in that case, we can implement an abstract class. In this case, what I call the abstract repeating repository. So I have an abstract class called abstract reading repository that implements pageable repository. And in this case, in my constructor, I can inject an entity manager, and that's a Java persistence entity manager and I'll get an entity manager injected into this, which allows me to construct my SQL queries and then create and execute native queries against that data source. So it's nice to get that out of the box, easy CRUD, but to also have that flexibility to run more advanced code on top of that is to me a really awesome feature. So essentially that is persistence in Micronaut. I mean, it's a little, I've kind of skimmed over a lot of it, but honestly, there's really not much more to it. So let's look now at the consumer. So I have a class called Green Thumb Consumer, and one of the other awesome features in Micronaut is an MQTT plugin. So I can add this dependency on the MQTT plugin, and out of the box, I'm able to add things like this MQTT subscriber, to my application. Annotated with MQTT subscriber, and the only other thing I need to do, well, I take that back. Of course, there's configuration, so if you look at the, my YAML file, you do have a little bit of configuration, which you would expect. You need to tell the client, uh, or the username, the password, the URL, things like that. But other than that, The only thing I need to do is tell it, annotate a receive method within that class that tells it what topic to consume. And every time a new message is 
received from that MQTT topic, this method will be invoked. So what do I do with that? Well, I have a single argument, and that is a what I call data, and that is a map with the keys being a string and the value being an object. The nice thing, about, one of the other awesome things about Micronaut is that, as I told you, I was publishing a JSON string to that MQTT topic. Micronaut is intelligent enough to deserialize that into an actual object just by telling it the signature in the receive method. So rather than receive a string and manually deserializing it, I can just tell Micronaut, hey, make sure that when you get this, it's a map with keys of string and values of object. And when that message comes in, that's what I get. And object, because obviously, like I said, there could be booleans, there could be floats, there could be various different values within that value of that JSON object. So the next thing I do is I just create a reading from that data, and I have a constructor that just accepts that map and calls all my getters and setters and gives me a reading object. Down here on line 55, I've injected the reading repository, which is what we just looked at, that CRUD repository. I've injected that into my consumer. And so I can just call that save async method, pass it the reading, and my reading is persisted. Based on the soil moisture level, one of the other things I wanted to add, because I, like I said, I did not automate the watering but I did want to keep an eye on it. So one of the things I implemented was a push notification to my mobile device so that if the level dropped below a certain threshold, I would get notifications. And if we, if we look over here, nope, I didn't get any when it was running. I don't think it was running long enough to, to send it. But essentially, I used a third-party system called Pushover, which is really cool. If you're not familiar with it, I do suggest you check it out. It's, a, it's an app that you install on your smartphone, pushover.net. And it's a one-time purchase, $5, and you can use it for, and I'm not, I'm not uh, associated with them, so this is not a commercial for them. It's just my endorsement. Uh, but it's a one-time $5 purchase, and you can use it for push notifications on your device. You, you get a user ID that is specific to your device, and through their APIs or through REST calls, you can send push notifications to your device. So you don't have to worry about coding your own Android app or iOS app and, you know, or desktop app for push notifications, you can just use their APIs, which I think is kind of nice. So I use this uh, pushover client in this case. If my water moisture level drops below a certain threshold and if it's been, and it, if, I don't want to send it every, every single time I get a reading, so I set an interval and basically every 20 minutes make sure that I'm sending this push notification. Um, and I use this pushover client push message method to, and I pass it the API key, my user key, and then the message itself that I want to send to the push notification. So let's take another look, at, uh, or let's take a look at the pushover client that I'm using. So another awesome feature of Micronaut is what they call declarative HTTP clients. And a declarative HTTP client, in this case, is an, inter an interface that's annotated with at client and the at client annotation accepts the root URL to use for that client. And it just has method signatures for each method that you want to uh, map to that HTTP endpoint. So in this case, the endpoint for the pushover REST API is slash one slash messages.json. It produces uh, application form URL encoded, and it consumes JSON. So I have this push message method, and at compile time, Micronaut takes care of all the nasty plumbing that's involved with making HTTP requests, and at runtime, I have this nice client ready to go. So I call this push message method. It maps all of these different parameters that, are, that I've defined in the signature to uh, URL parameters, and it constructs the request, sends the request, and allows me to do in this case, async calls, since I'm returning a flowable, uh, to that endpoint. And if we come back to the consumer, you can see that I'm calling the blocking first method. So 
I am using blocking, which kind of defeats the purpose of <laughs> making an async request. But essentially, all that hard work of all that plumbing involved in making HTTP calls in Java is done for me. I don't have to worry about it, and it's all good to go. Finally, the last thing I do here is I have this broadcaster, and I call the broadcast async method, and I pass it that data, which is that JSON object that comes in. Now, what is the broadcaster? The broadcaster is another awesome feature of Micronaut, uh, which is support for WebSockets. So it's an uh, instance of WebSocket Broadcaster. And if we look at WebSocket Broadcaster, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, WebSocket. So if we look at the Green Thumb WebSocket class that I have in this application, it's annotated with at server WebSocket and the URL endpoint that I want to use for that WebSocket. So we're all probably familiar with WebSockets, right? It's just a way for our JavaScript applications to kind of receive data pushed to them or send data back, real-time communication, real-time sockets inside the browser. Well, in this case, the only thing I need to do in Micronaut is create this class and then annotate certain methods with various annotations and then do something within those methods, right? So on open, when the... Uh, WebSocket connection is opened on a client. This method is called, and it just broadcasts a message. On message, that when it receives a message into the server, it will broadcast that message. So on close, so on and so forth. So it's a really easy way to get WebSocket communication in your Java application just with some annotations and some specifically named methods and properly annotated, so you have WebSocket communication. So if we go back to that consumer, like I said, I'm pushing that data out to the connected clients via that broadcaster. So essentially, that's it. I, I, I could show you the controller and views, but there's not much to them. I, just two endpoints. I have an index endpoint that shows me the, uh, the charts and graphs, and I have a reports page that I can use to display those reports. I'll show you that real quick because I didn't show you that. Uh, so if we look at the reports page, it's just some basic table-based uh, data, you know, what you'd expect to see in a reports page. And the, the index page has that WebSocket consumer, and that allows me to update those real-time charts. So I push those readings out to the, broad, to the uh, client. I save the last 25 of them. I think uh, if I look at my charts, I, it's the last 25 readings into an array, and I update my charts in real time. So um, jump back to the slides really, really quickly because I'm running out of time here. And jump down to the end. So what are the results, right? That's really the important thing. How did I do on the, on the results? So as you can see here, I was fairly pretty good on most of my results. The ones that I missed, I missed barely. But it allowed me to really kind of control this process and it was a really fun project. It allowed me to learn some new things. It allowed me to have some blog content to blog and, and put out there uh, on my blog. It allowed me to do this presentation. But all in all, it was a really fun project. And as you can see here, the seedlings did come up. They did grow. My peppers did come up. They did bloom, as you can see here. And I did make some hot sauce a couple weeks ago from this. Like the idiot I am, I forgot to bring a bottle to share with all of you. So uh, <laughs> you'll have to take my word on it that it came out really well. And uh, yeah, that's it. So I have, as I said, uh, quite a long series of blog posts. If you're interested, down at the bottom of the screen there, there is a couple repos if you want to take a look at any of the code. Uh, it's all available up on, on GitHub. And uh, any questions? Cool. Here's my blog, here's my socials. If you want to chat, hook up, be friends. I'll be your best friend. Thank you.